peace of Jesus be with you all, the peace that he brought between us and God. The word of God, as I mentioned, that we're going to be looking at today are the words from the gospel lesson, the gospel of St. Mark. I'd like to just reread the last few verses of that text again. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, Jesus our Savior wants the members of his church to be at peace with one another. And in the scriptures, again and again, the scriptures tell us that we need to be at unity through the bond of peace. Excuse me for just a second. Let me look at this here. There we go. Okay. He wants us to have the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. But there are many Christian congregations that are divided that have disharmony. What is it that breaks the bond? What is it that causes Christians to bicker with one another, to look at each other with suspicion, instead of being at peace and harmony with one another? Scripture tells us in many places. It says it is envy. It is jealousy. It is selfish ambitions and pride and stubbornness. Above all, it gets down to a matter of living without repentance. Living in repentance, you see, is when the Holy Spirit, through God's word, continuously changes our hearts. And the Holy Spirit does that in three ways. First of all, as he, through God's word, tests our attitudes and our actions so that comparing them to God's word, we become aware that we all fail what God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. And then the Holy Spirit, through that same word, leads us to cling with all our might only to Jesus for our salvation, understanding that in Jesus we have forgiveness, complete and total. And then the Holy Spirit reforms our attitudes and actions through that same word and changes us from having a self-focus in our life to a focus on loving others. But you see, last week when we talked, we talked about how Jesus' disciples had gotten back into that self-focus mindset. They weren't living in that attitude of repentance anymore. And so they began to argue with each other about who was the greatest in Christ's kingdom. And Jesus had to take a little child and set it down in front of them and point to that little child and say, unless you serve this little child, unless you honor and receive this little child, you are not great at all in my kingdom because service is the greatest. Now those words must have pricked the conscience of the Apostle John just a little bit as we get into our text which followed that text. Because we find that John and the other disciples had seen a man that was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And they thought that that wasn't right. They were jealous of him doing that because he wasn't part of their inner group. And so they told him to stop casting those demons out in Jesus' name. And now John comes to Jesus and he's not sure. Was he wrong about that? Jesus said we're supposed to receive little children. What about this man who is casting out demons in Jesus' name? So he asked Jesus about it. And Jesus' response was to rebuke them. He said, don't stop him. And why not? Because he's a believer. 
because he's doing it in my name. And you see, that makes him part of us. It makes him one with us. He's for us, not against us. And then Jesus explained to them, if somebody even gives somebody a glass of water, does a menial little thing, but he does it because he loves me, does it in my name, he's great in the kingdom of God. And he's to be accepted as an equal with you in the kingdom of God. And that's where it's at, isn't it? That's really the whole gist of what Jesus is getting at here. If we want to be at peace and harmony with one another in Christ's church, we have to get away from that world's idea of class and status, don't we? Because first of all, we have to understand that we are all equally sinful in God's eyes and equally saved by Jesus so that there is no difference in our status before God, not for any of us. And that as we carry out our roles, and we all have different roles, and what we do in God's church, some may be great things, some maybe not such great things in the eyes of the world. And yet all of those roles don't make one of us better than another, that we should be jealous or envious or think more highly of ourselves than others. And that's what keeps that peace and harmony. Now Jesus, in order to make that point even more clear to us, shares with us some pretty terrifying things. They're scary. And let me first help you understand how scary they are by explaining a word to you that's used in our text. And it's translated with the word stumble, causing somebody to stumble. But that word that's translated cause someone to stumble actually has a little bit deeper, richer meaning to it that we need to understand. Let me illustrate it this way. You all know what a, a mouse trap is, right? That little wood thing with the spring on it that goes flap, right? And on that mouse trap, there's that little part where we put the cheese, where we put the peanut butter, right? It's that little trigger. And when we set the trap, when we pull the spring back, there's a little piece of metal that goes to that tri trigger, kind of loosely connected, right? And so when little mousey comes up and he steps on that little tra trigger to get that cheese, he hits the trigger and whack, right? And you got dead mouse, right? The word that Jesus uses is really that trigger. To stumble really means to be a trigger, a death trigger, a death trap to someone. By leading someone into a sin that could pull them away from Jesus, that could ultimately end up in their being eternally condemned because they lose their faith or they stumble into a sin that takes them away from faith. That's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? And Jesus then starts out by saying, if any of you are that little trigger, are that death trap to one of these little ones who believe in me, speaking not only of little children, but of other Christians who maybe are weaker in their faith. So if we do something that causes them to doubt their faith, to stumble into their, in their faith, to begin to doubt God, or to do a sin that might cause them to lead, lead them into hell, then Jesus says, it is better for us to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around our neck than to do that. Now a millstone, this is a millstone. This is one that was pulled by a donkey. That's what it's not talking about, a little grinder here in your hand. It's talking about one of these big wheels that's made of stone that was on top of another stone that ground the grain and the, the ox or the donkey would pull it and turn it around. It's a huge stone. If you had that tied around your neck and were thrown into the sea, you'd have no chance of living. It would be a horrible way to die because you'd be dragged down to the bottom of the sea and you'd drown. Jesus says, that's better. That would be a better end for us than to cause the, one of these little ones to stumble, that is to be that death trigger to them. That's kind of frightening, isn't it? How many of us would say we've never done something that could cause a young child to sin or to do something wrong? But then Jesus goes on. He gets even scarier because he says something about our bodies. 
Now let me pause for a second and just ask you a different question. If you had a disease, uh, something that infection that got into your body, that was so terrible an infection that no medicine would stop it, the doctors tried everything they could, they couldn't get that infection to stop, and it was in danger of spreading to the rest of your body, what do you suppose the next step your doctor would suggest to you would be? Cut it out, right? To amputate to get rid of it, because that would save the rest of your body. Well, Jesus now enters into a discussion about something spiritually that's just as drastic as that is. He talks about our body parts, our hands, our feet, our eyes, etc., and says, if you have any of those parts of your body that is a death trigger to you, in other words, that it might lead you into doing something that would lead you to hell, the answer is to cut it off to amputate that part of your body. Wow, that's scary stuff. Who of us could say, for example, our hand doesn't cause us at some point to sin? What, what hand of ours hasn't touched something that it shouldn't have touched? What hand of ours hasn't poked or hit or struck somebody else or even disciplined in anger instead of in love? What hand of ours hasn't clicked on that mouse on our computer and gone to a screen that we shouldn't have been looking at? What hand of ours hasn't thrown down something carelessly that we should have been taking care of? What hand of ours hasn't touched another person perhaps in a way that we shouldn't have been touching them? Jesus says, then cut it off. Or what about our feet? Who of us doesn't have a foot that has taken us to a place we shouldn't be? that has walked into the, the face of temptation with us. A foot that's taken us into a room that maybe we're ashamed that we ever went into. A foot that takes us away from responsibilities instead of to responsibilities. Or feet that have walked away from God rather than walked to him and hearing his word. And Jesus says, cut it off. Or what about our eyes? Who of us hasn't had an eye that has looked at things that that eye shouldn't have looked at? Or maybe looked at things with greed and envy for them? Or maybe looked at someone else with that evil eye because we've had malice or hatred for them and given them an eye like that? Who of our eyes has not watched TV shows or movies that we know we shouldn't have been watching? Who of us has eyes that have not caused us to sin? Jesus says, then gouge it out. Wow. That's some pretty serious stuff, isn't it? But what good would it do, right? If we cut off one hand, what about the other one? Wouldn't the other one lead us into sin? And if we cut off one foot, what about the other one? Wouldn't it begin to cause us to sin too? And if we cut out and gouged out one eye, wouldn't the other one do it too? You see, we'd end up cutting off more and more parts. And finally, Jesus' church would only be made up of maimed and crippled people. What's Jesus' point? Jesus' point is that sin is really, really bad. And we are filled with sin. And the final reality is it's not the hands and the feet. It's the heart that's the problem. We'd finally have to cut out our heart. And it would have to be sent to the fire that doesn't stop burning. See, Jesus is helping us to realize that we in ourselves are totally and utterly sinful. We have nothing, not in our hands, not in our feet, not in our heart to offer to God. And so he wants to turn us away from those things in our life, and he wants us to turn to the one whose hands and heart and feet and eyes were pure who never had one of those triggers towards other people, who never had a trigger in his own self that would lead him into sin, Jesus, our Savior. He wants us to be turned to the one who took his hands, those pure hands and those pure feet, and put them up on a cross and let them be nailed on that cross for us and for our impurities. He wants us to see eyes 
that are so pure that they looked upon us, though we were totally and utterly sinful, with unbelievable compassion and love. A love that loved us so much, he was willing to lay down everything for us and for our salvation. And because he did, God sees us with pure hands and pure feet and pure hearts and pure eyes. That's all God sees when he looks at us, but not because of anything we can do, but only because of what Jesus has done for us. And so Jesus then ends after giving us this kind of a frightening section. He ends by saying, so be salty Christians. Be salty Christians. Everyone will be salted with fire, he says. Now that phrase in this last section has been interpreted in so many different ways. You look in commentaries out there, you're going to find all kinds of explanations. But the simplest explanation that seems to fit the context best is exactly what I said earlier. The salt that is in us, that's that fire, is the Holy Spirit working his powerful repentance in our hearts. And that's what keeps harmony and peace in Christ's church, is when we understand through the Holy Spirit working in his word how completely sinful we all are, each and every one of us, and then understand how completely saved we are only through Jesus. You see, that makes us understand that there's no one here better than another. There's no one here greater than another. We all equally stand before God as sinners and as completely saved saints through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? In other words, if we stop living in repentance, if we stop living in repentance, then that peace disappears then that harmony disappears because we no longer have a correct understanding of who we are in Christ. And that's why Jesus says, salt is good. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Live in repentance. Live with that mindset. Be salty Christians and you'll serve together in my church. And as we already looked, that's not an easy thing to do. It's kind of a, a difficult thing because we have to admit everything that Jesus just told us about ourselves, which we don't like to admit. We have to understand that that little death trap is all around us constantly in our bodies, and, and we're in danger of using that on others, that little death trap, and leading them away from Jesus. And the result, Jesus says, is to be in hell, where the fire doesn't go out and the worms don't stop eating the body. Eternal torment. But Jesus wants to turn us away from all that, away from our failures this morning, and to his success, his success in our place. And as we see that success, his message to us is forgiven. Forgiven, 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 forgiven. Equally forgiven before God, with the same status before God for every single one of us equally loved by God, everyone together. And with that understanding in our hearts and minds, constantly worked by the Holy Spirit, daily, we are salty Christians. And Jesus says to his salty Christians, salty Christians, keep the peace. Work together in my church.